Hi, my name is Brian Caffo. I'm in the Department of Biostatistics at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. This is Mathematical Biostatistics Boot Camp, and this is Lecture 1, where we'll cover some introductory material. In this lecture, we'll talk about the basics of biostatistics and motivate it. We will abstract the idea of an experiment. We'll go over some basic set notation, because set notation in the context of probability has a slightly different interpretation than classical set notation. And then we'll cover some of the very basics of probability. Let's talk very briefly about the subject of biostatistics. My department, the Department of Biostatistics, in its 2007 self-study, we attempted to define biostatistics. The definition that we came up with, it was actually quite difficult to get everyone to agree, but this is what we came up with. Biostatistics is a theory and methodology for the acquisition and use of quantitative evidence in biomedical research. Biostatisticians develop innovative designs and analytic methods target at increasing available information, improving the relevance and validity of statistical analysis, making the best use of available information, and communicating relevant uncertainties. Now, I think there's a lot of very important topics in that definition, and it captures our discipline quite well. I have a, a much more simple definition of biostatistics that I like to use. And the definition that I like to think of is that experimentation and empiricism are ultimately the language of science. Inductive reasoning based on empiricism is, in my opinion, how the vast majority of science gets conducted. And I think of statistics as the language of empiricism. Simply put, that statistics is the the uh, formal syntax associated with empiricism. And so when you're studying statistics, I think you're actually studying how to conduct experiments and quantify information from experimental and empiric knowledge. Let me give you one of the most famous recent examples where existing clinical practice was reversed by empirical evidence. There was a clinical trial uh, that published its result in 2002 and the amazing part about this clinical trial is that it contradicted prior evidence on the efficacy of hormone replacement therapy. Up to that point, hormone replacement therapy had been near universally thought of as a good treatment for postmenopausal women. In fact, the trial evidence was exactly the opposite and suggested the possibility of some harm. When conducting this experiment, the statisticians and the epidemiologists and et cetera that designed the trial had to come up with ways in which to decide whether or not to stop the trial, whether or not to keep the trial going, and how to quantify the evidence. In this case, they had a statistically based protocol that they executed and the study was stopped due to an excess number of negative events. And I don't think I can appropriately describe how counterintuitive this was to the medical community at the time. But the key ingredient that I want to discuss is this bolded text here, where it was, in fact, a statistical decision based on probability that had to decide whether or not enough evidence had been collected at the time to make a decision to stop the trial or to continue going. This is an incredibly important decision because it's unlikely that another trial of this scope would have been able to have been executed anytime soon. So cutting it short would have the incredibly negative benefit of not having the full information available. However, keeping it going based on the evidence of an excess number of negative events could possibly put people at harm. So I just hope you understand the, the central role that statistics was playing in the decision in this trial. Another very good example of statistics kind of in the similar vein was ECMO, which is extracorporeal membrane oxygenation treatment. This is a treatment for newborn infants. It was an incredibly promising treatment. It is, it is currently a standard treatment. And there was quite a bit of enthusiasm at the time of its creation that it would be a, a revolutionary treatment. So when they conducted the trial, it was very difficult to consider how you would conduct a trial for a treatment that has such obvious potential benefits. 
the ethical considerations in the trial wound up leading to a statistical design or randomization scheme whereby only one infant received the control therapy. That in turn introduced criticisms, sample size based, about the design itself. In this particular case, because the treatment was so potentially beneficial, it was difficult to figure out how exactly to conduct a trial to evaluate its efficacy. And in this case, only one instance were they actually willing to give the control therapy to a child. However, then immediately the degree of evidence to actually evaluate the therapy was very weak. So in this case, it wasn't just statistical considerations. It was ethical considerations and medical considerations all bundled together. So I hope these two examples illustrate the central role statistics plays in making public health decisions and making medical decisions and evaluating evidence. Let me just summarize again. Biostatistics is playing a central role in public health in design, analysis, and interpretation of statistical data. And here at Johns Hopkins in the Bloomberg School of Public Health, we have kind of a what I would like to consider a prevailing philosophy for conducting biostatistics that cuts across all of the departments. And of these, we include a, a tight coupling of the methods that we use with the ethical and scientific goals. We pay special attention to emphasizing scientific interpretation of statistical evidence and try to use that interpretation to impact public policy. And of course, we try to acknowledge our assumptions and evaluate the robustness of our conclusions to these assumptions. And I think these three principles underlie the majority of scientific research going on at the school. This is not to say this is actually the only way to think about doing statistics. Think of regulatory agencies like the Food and Drug Administration. There, they may not want a tight coupling of the statistical methods with the scientific goals. In contrast, what they may actually want is the statistical procedures to protect consumers regardless of the scientific evidence. Their loss function is, in essence, quite different. They may want to actually divorce the statistical methods from the science so that they can, in the most possibly unbiased way, evaluate a drug. This is not to say this is exactly how the Food and Drug Administration does things. I've never worked there, so I can't say with certainty. However, it's clear that different organizations and different entities would think about statistics and how it applies to scientific problems in different ways. Here at Hopkins in the School of Public Health and at the Hopkins University more broadly, we are largely a research institution. We like to think of the statistics, statisticians, and those doing statistics as being highly embedded in the scientific process and in the scientific inquiry. So this is a very brief section, but a very important section on the idea of abstracting the notion of an experiment. Probably everyone has an idea of what an experiment is, and they are probably thinking of people in white lab coats, say with mice and test tubes and beakers and that sort of thing. In statistics, we think of an experiment in a much more abstract and general way. Basically, we're going to think of an experiment as any purposeful inquiry that involves a non-trivial amount of error and randomness that we need to evaluate. That is going to be our notion of experiment. So looking at the second bullet point, of course, something like a laboratory experiment would fall under this definition. But we also think of basically any collection of measurements from a sample population. For example, if you wanted to study hypertension and you figured out a mechanism to sample and ask people their hypertension status, that would constitute an experiment just as much as the laboratory experiment in the way that we're thinking about them. Now, of course, in different kinds of experiments, there's different levels of evidence that come about, but in all of these, we're going to think of them as an experiment that requires statistical analysis. So another example of an experiment is a clinical trial, like the Women's Health Initiative that we just talked about in the ECMO trial. A recent and very important kind of experiment is a simulation uh, computer experiment. So in addition to being very valuable tools for performing analysis, 
computers are increasingly becoming methods of actually generating the experiment. To give you a specific example of this, I work with colleagues across the street in the Division of Medical Imaging Physics, and when they're evaluating a new imaging technique, before they run very costly human or animal trials, they will actually design a computer experiment to evaluate image processing techniques, image analysis techniques, and so on. And they have highly accurate models of the imaging system that they've built. They added in randomness and other sources of variation. And then this produces a vast amount of data that they need a very sophisticated statistics to actually evaluate. And as a result, they can run quite detailed and quite accurate experiments entirely in silico, as they say, before they start running expensive human trials and animal trials. Another form of experiment is the so-called retrospective sampling experiment. So in many cases, it's very difficult to follow patients over time and ascertain disease status as it comes about, so-called prospective studying. Instead, it's frequently the only possible avenue available is to study things retrospectively. That is to say from hospital records or however, figure out who has a disease or a condition, compare them with controls who do not have the disease or condition but maybe have similar ages or and demographics, and evaluate historically what their exposures were. This is so-called retrospective sampling, and it is frequently done because it's the only way to study a phenomenon or the only convenient way to study a phenomenon when you're first looking at it. Each of these different kinds of experiments offer different sources of variation, different sources of experimental error, different kinds of randomness to be evaluated with statistical models. What we're going to talk about for the next several lectures is how we're going to connect these numbers resulting from all of these experiments and many others to probability models. And to do that, we're going to have to understand the subject of probability at a deeper level. And so that's what we're going to go over next is the basic mathematics of probability. But while we're doing that, keep in mind that the eventual goal is to connect these probability models to the actual data. Okay, so before we begin discussing probability, we need some very basic mathematics. Now, Everyone listening to this lecture will have had set notation at some point in their life and covered it from a very basic or even more advanced mathematical perspective. In probability, the set notation has the same rules, of course. It's just a subset of ordinary set notation. However, the interpretations of set notation are slightly different. So usually when you talk about set notation, you talk about some uber space that contains everything. Well, in statistics, we call this the sample space, and that we usually denote with an uppercase omega. And this is the collection of all possible outcomes of an experiment. So as in a simple example, let's conduct an experiment. We roll a die. So the, all, the possible set of outcomes are 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, or 6, where here we're not going to play the sort of mental games that the die could land on an edge or a corner or something like that. It has to roll on one of the numbers. And then the sample space would be the integers from 1 to 6. An event is any subset of the sample space. So, for example, you could have the event that the die roll is even, i.e. that E is the set containing the numbers 2, 4, and 6. Certain kinds of events are so uh, commonly talked about that we give them a separate name. An elementary or simple event is the particular result of an experiment. So, for example, if the die roll is a 4, then usually we denote this with a lowercase omega, omega equals 4. Here we don't tend to split hairs about the actual number 4 and the set containing the element 4, but I think in the traditional definition, a simple event is the actual element for, not the set containing the element for. But here, I don't think for our purposes that distinction will be necessary. And then it's always useful to talk about nothing. So the null event is actually the event that nothing occurs, the null event or empty set. And that's usually denoted with this letter here, which I'll just call null.
again, the sets in probability theory follow all the same rules as ordinary set notation, of course, because it is exactly ordinary set notation, but just with different interpretations. So when we say that a elementary event is an element of an event, then that implies that E occurs when W occurs. So for example, if an elementary event is not in an event, that implies that E does not occur when W occurs. For example, if the elementary event is a 5, 5 not being in the set of even numbers means that when you roll a 5, you have not rolled an even number. We can follow along this logic. So for example, E being a subset of F implies that the occurrence of E implies the occurrence of F. So for example, let's take E as the event that the die roll is even, E equals 2, comma 4, comma 6, and F is the event that the die is either even or a 5. Hence, F is the event 2, comma 4, comma 6, and 5. So 2, 4, 5, 6 then the occurrence of E implies the occurrence of F. That is, if you roll an even die roll, then you have also rolled an element of the set of even die rolls plus 5. Okay, if the standard set intersection, E intersect F, implies that both E and F occur. So to give you a specific example of this, imagine that E is the event that the die roll is even, F is the event that the die roll is a prime number. So just so let's think of what the prime numbers would be on a die roll. That would be 2, 3, and 5. So E intersect F means that the die roll is both even and prime. That would just be the number 2. So the event E intersect F occurs means that you get a, both a even number and a prime number, which, of course, in this case would mean that you get a 2. E union F is the standard set notation for union, but in probabilistic interpretation, it means that at least one of E or F occur. So in my previous example, it would mean that I either get an even number or a prime number, or both in the case of two. If E intersect F is the null set, that means that both E and F cannot simultaneously occur. So imagine E is the set of even numbers, F is the set of odd numbers, then you cannot roll a die that is both even and odd. So E intersect F will be the null set. And that's important enough that we give it its own name. So in bold here, you see its own name. That's called mutually exclusive. If So if we say that two events are mutually exclusive, that means that they both cannot occur. And you frequently hear people use the phrase mutually exclusive incorrectly. So what it technically means, things are mutually exclusive if they cannot both simultaneously occur. And then the complement of an event, E complement, or sometimes we might write E with a little bar on top of it, that is the event that E did not occur. So in our case where E is an even number, 2, 4, 6, E complement is the odd numbers, okay? 1, 3, and 5. Since something and its opposite cannot simultaneously occur, their intersection is always the null set, so E and E complement are always mutually exclusive. Just looking back at the previous slide, if our elementary event is that the die roll is a 4, and the event is that it is even, if you roll a 4, then the roll was even. There's some standard set theory facts that we should also just remind you of. There's the famous so-called De Morgan's Laws. So A intersect B complement is A complement union B complement. And the way to think about this is this little complement symbol sort of distributes itself across the parentheses to A and B, A complement and B complement, and it flips the cap into a cup. And then what's nice is if you look at the second example of De Morgan's Law, A union B complement is A complement intersect B, the same thing happens. This C distributes itself across the parentheses, so you get A complement and B complement, and in this case the cup turns into a cap. So De Morgan's Law basically says if you complement across an either intersection or union, the complement distributes itself, 
but it flips everything. It flips all the cups and caps. Okay, so I struggled to come up with a verbal example of De Morgan's laws, and here's the best I could do. Let's let A be the event that you're an alligator, and B be the event that you're a turtle. So the event that A union B is the event that you were either a turtle or an alligator. And then complementing that, that means if an alligator or a turtle you are not, then De Morgan's law says that's A complement intersect B complement. A complement is you are not an alligator, intersect B complement is you are not a turtle. So the set theory association with the English would be if an alligator or a turtle you are not, then you are not an alligator and you are also not a turtle. That is the equivalence between those two sentences. I think everyone would agree those two sentences agree. Another example for the second De Morgan's Law, if your car is not both hybrid and diesel, so A is the event that your car is hybrid, B is the event that your car is diesel, and you complement their intersection. So if your car is not both hybrid and diesel, then your car is either not hybrid or not diesel. So A complement, union B complement. Okay, some other small little facts that I'm sure you remember from set theory. A complement complement is A. So if you do not not get an even number, you get an even number. And A union B quantity intersection C is A intersect C union B intersect C. So the way to think about this, just to remember it, is think of the union as sort of plus and the intersection is sort of multiplication, and this little rule looks just exactly like the distributed property. So C sort of gets multiplied by A, C gets multiplied by B, and it sort of distributes across the plus sign, sort of the union. So that's the way you can sort of remember that one. So that gives you a very basic Rosetta Stone, taking ordinary set notation and connecting it to how we think about it in probability. Next, we're going to actually use the set notation to develop uh, probability. So this is a very brief section, and in this discussion, we're just going to talk about probability at its very conceptual level, and in the next section, we'll talk about probability at its sort of mathematical foundation. But I wanted to spend a minute talking about where we're going with probability as a modeling tool to analyze data. And here's a strategy that underlies much of science. And the idea is, is this. For a given experiment, attribute everything that you know to a systematic model. So a good example of this are things like lines and planes and hyperplanes, where people presume that an outcome, say something like hypertension, depends on a lot of predictors in a linear fashion. And so that's either known or it's theorized or it's assumed for sake of convenience. But that relates known predictors to the known outcome. And then attribute everything else to randomness. Now, this is a very difficult bullet to swallow, I think, for many people, because in nearly all applications of probability, what the word random means is very difficult to tie down. As example, earlier on in the lecture, we were talking about retrospectively sampling hospital records. And in this case, if you were to model the outcome of whether or not a person had a disease, as is predicted by their history, where we perform some form of retrospective sampling, it's not exactly clear where the randomness is coming from, or even what randomness means in this context. So even if that's the case, we still often use probability to evaluate the collection of unknown things in an experiment, treating them as if they were random. And then we have to just be careful in how we interpret our probability statements in that context relative to what the word random is, is meaning in that case. In some other settings, people have very specific definitions of what random means. For example, sometimes people will analyze clinical trials using the randomization that was used to assign patients to treatment or control as the actual probability that they're modeling in their mathematical models. And there they can point very directly to what randomness they're modeling. However, that has its own problems as well. So I just want to say that, that this process of using probability, the third point, using probability to quantify the uncertainty in your conclusions 
to model this randomness is actually a very delicate subject. And as you can imagine from this discussion, all three of these first bullet points come with quite a bit of baggage in the terms of assumptions and things that you cannot evaluate at all. And so what we'd like to do is check how sensitive our conclusions are to the assumptions in these models. In some cases, we can actually directly verify them. We can check whether the relationship between the response and the predictors looks kind of like a line, so we're okay modeling it as a line. In other cases, they involve assumptions that we can't possibly check. They involve variables that we did not collect or variables that we do not even know. And in this case, we have to evaluate our sensitivity to our model in terms of unknowns. We have to evaluate how robust our approach is to the unknowns. And this comes from the study of how the data was collected, how the statistics were used, what exactly is probability actually modeling. In the what follows, we're going to both cover the mathematics of probability, but hopefully touch on these subjects. Now, I want to emphasize that these are very, very difficult topics that many people struggle with, if thought of with sufficient depth. And what we hope to do in this class is mostly get you started thinking about this. And I think if you just did one thing when thinking about probability and your data that you're analyzing, is when you say, I have a 95% confidence interval, or my p-value is blank, or something like this, where you actually use probability in your actual data analysis, go through the exercise of trying to think, what is it that your modeling is random? What is the sources of this randomness? And how good of a job do you think your probability statements do at characterizing this randomness? This is the end of Mathematical Biostatistics Boot Camp Lecture 1. In this lecture, we covered basic conceptual ideas. And next lecture, we're going to be covering much of the basic mathematics that underlies probability. So make sure you have plenty of coffee to get ready. <laughs>